Well, good afternoon, guys, and uh, here we are recording once again. I'm Pastor Gary, uh, Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County, and this is our off-road portion of our Study 66, where we're going through all 66 books of the Bible. And um, uh, it's a neat journey. Uh, the goal of this is to give you an overview of the Bible, but to also show you how it kind of ties together. Uh, take, for instance, now we're, we're uh, looking at 1 Samuel um, second Samuel coming up, uh, literally first and second Samuel were just one book at one time, uh, one letter, one scroll. And, uh, in the, in the days of the Septuagint, they decided to separate them into first Samuel, second Samuel. But as we look at Samuel to, to give you the idea of the thematic portion of this, we know that we were looking at the book of judges and judges, of course, is that time where you had no centralized government. You just had different judges ruling over different areas that God had appointed. And, um, and so we go through this time of judges, and, and it says there that, that during this time there was no king. We believe Samuel wrote the book of Judges. Now we get through the book of Ruth, which happened during the time of the judges, and now we're out of Ruth, and we're coming up into the time of, of 1 and 2 Samuel. And, and how do we know this? Because now we're going to see kings. We're going to see kings. Who was the last, who would be considered then the last judge? Well, the last judge would have been Samuel is who that was. Now, if you come Sunday morning, and I hope you do, um, you're going to hear basically the, the foundation of uh, the book of Samuel. You'll hear about Samuel's life. And uh, so you'll find out more information at that point. So what I want to do today is give you what I find to be one of the, one of the more intriguing stories out of First and Second Samuel. So I want to share that with you briefly. And it has to do really kind of going all the way back to my childhood. And when I say all the way back, I mean all the way back to my childhood. I, I remember being a, a, a little guy. And um, when I was little, we used to have what we would call the wonderful world of Disney. And it would come on Sunday nights. And we were all excited to see it. And you can see I was in my pajamas with my little footsie bottoms on them and everything else. And uh, usually there was something, you know, a snack or something along those lines. And we would watch The Wonderful World of Disney. And one of my favorite, favorite stories in The Wonderful World, world of Disney was the one that revol revolved around the legend of Sleepy Hollow. In fact, I believe the story was called The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Mr. Toad. Uh, something along those lines. And Disney was always very, very creative. And, and what I loved about it was the story of, of uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, you're probably saying, Gary, what in the world does the legend of Sleepy Hollow have to do with, with um, the book of Samuel, with what's going on here? Well, <clears throat> if you know anything about it, you know that the name Ichabod is an odd name. And in the legend of Sleepy Hollow, the, the star, I guess you could say, of, of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, you could look at it and say, well, maybe it was the Headless Horseman, uh, but it was also Ichabod Crane, a man named Ichabod Crane. And so when you mention that to the average person's mind, that's what you think of. Ichabod is Ichabod Crane. He was the schoolmaster character of Washington Irving's famous short story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. In the story, Washington Irving tells of Ichabod Crane, a schoolmaster. And if you remember him, and, and of course, this story is well known. It was done a few years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, it was updated. Uh, so you know a little bit about it. You know a little bit about what happens. He ends up seeking. He comes to a town, Tarrytown, outside of New York City uh, back in the late 1700s, according to Irving's uh, timetable. And uh, he comes to that region to teach the school children school. And uh, he falls in love with a woman named Katrina, uh, and, um, and they were going to live happily ever after and so forth. But we know that doesn't happen uh, because in the story, a headless horseman haunts this countryside, this colonial countryside. And one night, Ichabod encounters this, uh, this uh, horrible, horrible ghost apparition, whatever you want to call him, specter. And um, on, he's on his horse, and I think his horse was named Gunpowder. And uh, the Headless Horseman was on his uh, black steed that was charging and all the rest. And you could interpret it either way. Either Ichabod makes it across a covered bridge and, and heads out and never is seen again. Or what's sort of intimated is Ichabod doesn't quite make it. We don't see his body or anything else. But there's some stuff that's found by a smashed pumpkin and so forth. Blah, 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 blah. 
So anyway, if you ever want to rent the movie or whatever else, it's a good movie. And the reason I bring it up is the name Ichabod and the name Ichabod Crane, Ichabod is taken from the scriptures is where it's taken from. It's found in a couple places in the Bible. First Samuel, so the story in First Samuel chapter 4, verse 21 says, she, and we'll get into who the she is, named the child Ichabod, which means where is the glory or or literally the idea that the glory has departed. You know, uh, it used to be a, a statement that was made in the days of Elvis Presley when he would leave a building. Elvis has left the building. He's departed. Well, the glory of the Lord has departed uh, is what was said there. She named him this because the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. This is what the scripture says. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark has been captured. And then again in, in chapter 14, verse 3, it's mentioned there too. So who is this Ichabod? Ichabod is the son of Phinehas and the grandson of Eli. Remember, Eli was the priest over Israel at the time, and his two sons, Phinehas uh, and Hophni, were the other two, uh, were the two sons of, of our uh, priest Eli is what they were. And uh, they're found in 1 Samuel, and you can read about their story in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and chapter 4. Now, unfortunately for Israel, uh, they were corrupt. Uh, Phinehas and Hophni were extremely corrupt people, and um, these priests, and terrible, terrible stuff that was going on. Uh, Israel basically was, I would say that these two were basically spiritually lost people. I don't, I don't even think you could call them believers by any means. Um, their, their wickedness was evidenced by what? Well, uh, the, the way they conducted their priestly duties, a uh, terrible thing, 1 Samuel chapter 2, 13 to 17, but also in the perverted practices of sinful things that they would do that, that, that were evidenced in their lives. I mean, you had these priests that were doing some of the worst things imaginable. So um, they were so bad. Listen to how bad they were. You know, we always talk about this God of grace, this God of mercy. They were so bad, it tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 25, that God desired to kill them, that God wanted to kill them. And that's what happened. Their deaths came by the way of battle with the Philistines. Remember, the Philistines, and we're going to hear a lot about them throughout 1 and 2 Samuel. You'll read a lot of stories. You know, you meet the most interesting people, David, uh, uh, Samuel, uh, Saul. So you're meeting these people. And of course, the numero uno um, uh enemies of Israel being the Philistines. So uh, it was in a Philistine battle or Israel battling with the Philistines that these two, uh, Phinehas and Hophni, would ultimately be killed. And in a roundabout way, their father Eli, who was the priest, would be killed also. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. Um, this is what happened. The Israelites find themselves under attack um, and they decide to take the Ark of the Covenant uh, into the battle. So the Israelites... Phineas and Hophni decided, well, what we're going to do. Now, remember, Eli, their dad, he's about 100 years old at this time. So Phineas and Hophni say, hey, battle's going against us. We need, we need to rally, boys. So they go get the Ark of the Covenant. Now, they never consulted with God. They just kind of treated the Ark of the Covenant like it was a good luck charm. And if we grab this thing, then, then God has to perform for us because he's done this in the past. They never, ever went before the Lord and entreated of the Lord. Because remember, again, we said the Lord was very angry at them. And so they thought if they dragged it into the battle, that Israel would rally and they would defeat the Philistines. Now, what's interesting about that was when the, when the army of Israel saw the ark, they did shout and they did, um, they, they did rally for a while. In fact, the Philistines were scared. It was in the evening and they heard the camp of Israel, which they had been defeating regularly, cheering and they thought what in the world's gone on they looked they saw the ark of the covenant and and they thought oh my goodness israel has the the place of their gods with them now understand in that day they thought they were kind of that's exactly what it was that they were carrying their gods with them well the philistine generals rallied the men and said boys you know if you're defeated by israel you're going to be in their slaves so you better fight with everything you have your your wives your children your lands everything will be taken they remembered the stories they remembered what happened when joshua when joshua was carrying the ark of the covenant how he defeated all the all the armies in israel at the time in the promised land so they had good reason to be afraid well they rallied they beat israel once again why because god was not 
fighting for Israel in the sense of going to defeat the Philistines because Israel was so corrupt once again. So this is what happened. Um, and so anyway, with all this corruption that was going on, so they treat the ark as a magical good luck charm. And what happened was the Israelites lose 30,000 men. Hophni and Phinehas are included in that. And the ark ends up being taken. Now that's a huge deal in Israel that the ark was taken. Upon hearing this terrible news, Eli, Eli was a rotund big guy. He was a hundred years old, but he was a rather large guy. He falls over backward. He breaks his neck and he dies. Now Phineas, his son's pregnant wife, uh, went into labor hearing all this that was going on, hearing about her husband, Phineas, being killed, then her father-in-law dying. So she went into labor, bore a son, and she named the child Ichabod is what she did saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark has been captured and because her father-in-law uh, and her husband uh, have died. And she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured, 1 Samuel 4, 21 and 22. And so again, Ichabod, literally, there is no glory. There, she believed because of the death. And the scripture says that soon after that child Ichabod is born, she dies also. It's a real tragedy is what it is. Um, you know, when you stop and you think about the Ark of the Covenant being used as a good luck charm, when you think about these two boys, Phineas and Hophni, being so corrupt and, and perverted in their practices and everything else, it sounds almost like a, a terrible soap opera in some ways, but that's exactly what happens in this particular case. Uh, God's glory has departed. Um, one of the one of the uh, commentaries that I read put it this way: The glory of God is used to describe God's favor and blessing toward His people. In the Old Testament, God's glory is seen as a pillar of fire and cloud that follow the Israelites during the Exodus from Egypt, guiding and guarding them. Exodus thirteen and twenty one. Once the Ark of the Covenant was built and placed in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and later in the temple of Jerusalem. God's glory resided there as a symbol of his presence among his people. It was a symbol of his presence. When the ark was captured by the Philistines, the glory departed from the Israelites. Ichabod becomes a reality. Now, it's interesting because now if you fast forward from that time, Old Testament, you get an intertestament period of time. The glory is not there right now. Jesus Christ comes on the scene. Now, it's interesting what Christ does when he comes on the scene. Um, this concept of the glory of God leaving Israel. Think about it with me. We're, we're in the final week of Jesus's, you know, we're coming up to this time period. Uh, even now, you know, we celebrate uh, Resurrection Sunday and so forth. But Jesus enters in on his Passion Week and he will, he will um, reveal himself to the people. And what they're doing is they're giving the people a chance to accept. Now, we know they ultimately reject. Listen to what, what goes on in his final words. He's speaking to the religious leaders and he's speaking to the general populace of Israel. So this is the, the famous Jerusalem speech. And this is what he says there. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Now that's found in Matthew chapter 23, 37 and 38. Your house uh, um, is left to you desolate. This is the final statement that Jesus says to the general population, to their leaders. He's indicting them is what he's saying, right? They would not accept him as he came back into Jerusalem. So he is indicting the people. He's indicting their leaders all because of what? because now the house is desolate, because Ichabod has happened. The, the, the glory of God has departed from the land. Now, I want you to notice where it says there, whose house is it, right? He says, I've left your house desolate, um, not my father's house. He used to refer to it as, as his father's house, but now he doesn't. Now he says, it's your house. This is what you've done. You have caused the glory of God to depart from this place. And so God's left. God has left the building. Like we said earlier, when Elvis would leave the building, Elvis has left the building. Well, here God has left the building. He is no longer there. It is not the father's house. 
It is not my house. This is your house, is what Jesus said. Now, the Greek word for desolate there means to be abandoned to ruin. That means, you know, when you watch an older house in your neighborhood, no one's living there and you start to watch it fall apart. Well, this place in the same way has been left um, for abandonment. God's left. It's conver- uh, it's, it's, it has now been converted from the house of God into a place of desolation is what it is. We won't see, you, you, you don't, Jesus Christ has, has spoken and said, you guys are indicted by your own lack of faith and by your own corruption, uh, the vile things that you do. Very much like, very much like Phineas and Hophni uh, in, that, in that place. One last thought before I close off here in this wonderful little story about Ichabod. It is a terrible thing not to be able to recognize where the Spirit of God is working. If you are, if you are part of a body, part of a church, you should see spiritual things going on in that place. People becoming believers, uh, people giving their lives, their hearts over to, to Christ. You should also see healings. You should see healings of relationships. And, and there, will be, there will be physical healings that go on. We see people healed all the time. We see people becoming born again, people desiring to grow in the Lord, to walk with the Lord. You should be seeing these things. The saddest thing that can be uttered is this. There will be many churches that will operate and the oncoming Sundays that, that will operate just like they always do, but the Holy Spirit has already departed, has already left uh, that building. It is already declared Ichabod. <clears throat> May it never be said of your life that it is now Ichabod because the Spirit has departed, because you're no longer serving the Lord. May it never be said that, that churches like Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County, or other churches that are good fundamental Bible teaching churches. You know, when I say fundamental, I mean teaching the fundamentals of the word. May it never be said that uh, Ichabod over their door. May it never be said that the spirit's not moving, that miracles aren't happening. We should be seeing these things in these places because more than any other time, we are, we are absolutely caught up in a spiritual time in this country. May not always feel like it, but it really is true. And so we should be on the lookout of what the Holy Spirit is doing. You and I should be praying that the Spirit would fall and operate. We don't want to be Ichabod. We don't want to, to, to see that the Spirit has departed. Now one day, one day coming up very soon, the Holy Spirit will be restrained. The Holy Spirit, this world will experience Ichabod when the Holy Spirit is taken out uh, of this world. I hope that this has been a good study for you as we've gone through our uh, off-road program, as it were. I hope it wasn't too bumpy for you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you Sunday morning as we crack open First Samuel and take a more in-depth look at that person himself named Samuel. What a great, great man of the scriptures. Be blessed and uh, we'll see you Sunday. <music>